Hi there. You're listening to One of Eight Billion, a podcast about all of us. I'm your host, Ivan Stegic. This podcast is supported by 107, a technology studio whose mission is to make things that matter. Online at 107.com. We all have a story, don't we? We've all had successes and failures, joy and disappointment, love and sadness. And yet, we've all made it to here, to right now. Our stories are one amongst eight billion others. Eight billion other stories, each of them unique, each of them grand in their own way, and each of them a window into the humanity that connects us all. One of Eight Billion tells life stories from around the world. Let's listen. Our guest today is Sven Sandgard, a meteorologist, educator, and advocate for sustainable lifestyles to combat climate change. Sven is driven by curiosity and connection from an early age, he wanted to understand the science behind the weather, and he has dedicated his life to using knowledge to make a positive impact on the world. Welcome to One of Eight Billion. Would you please introduce yourself? I'm Sven Sungard. My full name, if you really want to know, Sven Olaf Sungard. Everybody under the age of 15 thinks that I was named after Frozen characters, but um, (laughs) sad to say I am 40 and a half years old. I'm definitely the original thing. I'm a meteorologist. I've been a meteorologist for about two decades, and that's led me into climate change work, conservation, combining. I love traveling around the world and I'm pretty passionate about conservation issues and it's a no-brainer overlap with climate change, which is the existential crisis of our time that we're trying to deal with. i am also been teaching part-time middle school earth science, which was fun. Let's see, I do real estate now. I, I'm wearing several different hats, a jack of all trades of sorts. Or a Sven Olaf of all trades. <laughs> yes. <laughs> where, where do you live in the world? Uh, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And what do you love about Minneapolis? What I love about Minneapolis is we have a really good airport hub connection to other places because <laughs> winter gets long and I need to get out. But otherwise, I'm born and raised in Minnesota, and I really do like the area because we always rank high on all those lists in terms of livability. And I always joke that they, they don't, they either don't factor in winter or they don't give it enough uh, maybe points. But uh, to quote my daddy, I always says that it kept the riffraff out. And I, I don't know if he, I don't know if he meant like invasive species or also different types of people, but I think it is to, to an extent, if you can imagine if we had the climate of Los Angeles, that everything else considered, we would be, probably one of the largest cities in the country, if not the largest. I like our outdoor space in Minneapolis. Thank heavens for Theo Wirth. People who aren't from or ever been to Minneapolis wouldn't know, but he had this vision over a century ago to set aside land to make this first-class park system, public lands available to people. And so Minneapolis has this great system of parks and with old forests in them and everything, old original forests. And so it's just, no matter where you are in the city almost, you can get to a great park within walking distance. And that was his original vision. So we have that and winter's too long. I do like the change of seasons. And it's fun to be in a place where it's so drastically different at different times of the year. And it gives you an opportunity to look at a a place in a different perspective four times a year. You can go, you can't get bored of a park, for example, if you go to it in its four different seasons, you're going to see something different. Every time. Yeah, I agree with you. That's one of the things I loved about Minneapolis when I first immigrated here was the different seasons. South Africa is great and all, and the climate's mostly temperate the whole year through, but there's just something about snow and and the change from fall to snow and back to spring. It's just wonderful, wonderful to see. Have you always had this love of weather and climate since you were a child, or is that something that you grew into? 
I, I grew into it in my childhood. I've always had a natural curiosity, which I think is the common thread in any scientist. You have to be naturally curious about why does that happen that right. way? Or why did it happen not the way that I thought it might? Because I've seen it do it this other way many times before, uh, which is even better because then you have to dive even deeper into a problem. So I always, you know, and I grew up on a a small farm, a hobby farm, we call it. So it wasn't a working farm. My parents had full-time jobs away, but we had animals and we had land. And so I think that just naturally makes you a little more in tune with the weather, the change of seasons, but also nature. And I think that's one thing that kind of scares me about a lot of kids in especially the U.S. today and in the urban U.S. not being connected enough to to nature and all the different species that are in it. But if you're not connected, if you don't know much about it, you're not going to appreciate it and, and want to protect it. And then I wanted to be a marine biologist. I had several aquariums at one point to the point where my mom made me move them all to the basement because it was too much for my bedroom. And I wanted to be a marine biologist and, and hearing all my relatives say, well, you can't be a marine biologist in Minnesota. You'd have to, we're nowhere near the ocean. And nobody told me, oh, you can move. Yeah. As like a nine or 10 year old, I'm like, oh, I guess that's out for me. And then I got into weather by about the age of 12. So we all grew up ski jumping in my family. My dad was in the 76 winter Olympics for ski jumping. Wow. Yeah. So another little fun fact. Yeah. Me and my brother and my sister all ski jumped. The early 90s were the first now of what become a new normal of mild winters with very undependable snow. And so that got me thinking, why are we not having snow? Because as a kid in the 80s, if you're from Minnesota, we had some just mega snow years. And then all of a sudden, the snow faucet was just turned off. And it was very mild. And it's been like that, as I said, overall since then. But it got me into getting excited. Oh, the weatherman's talking about the next snowstorm maybe in five days. And then it wouldn't happen or it'd miss us. And that really just led me into this. How did that happen? How did they forecast something and then it didn't pan out the way they thought it would? What all goes into all that? So that's what really led me into it. A lot of meteorologists have some exciting story about seeing a tornado or something. It wasn't anything like that. It was really, it was really a climate change thing. I didn't know it at the time, but now looking back, it was climate change that got me into weather. That's really interesting to think about it like that. I've always been frustrated with weather personally because I never felt like you could predict it enough in advance. And for some reason, when I was a kid in South Africa, I wanted to know what the next week was going to look like. And I wanted to know with certainty. And I'm sure that a lot of people are like that. Uh, And people get frustrated watching meteorologists on TV predict 10 days out, seven days out. Does that frustrate you as well? It does, but in a good way. You can't get bored in this field. That's what I think ah. is so great. And I do, but I guess in what science field do have we figured everything out? And then you can just be like, that's done. Let's move on to the next thing. There's always something. I think weather specifically, and the reason why people love to talk about it everywhere in the world is that it's this, it's the great ancient thing that we're always trying to control and want to get ahead of, like you were just saying. As soon as humans stepped out of hunter gatherer to agriculture, weather was everything, make or break. It wasn't like for planning yeah. vacations. It was about a matter of life or death. And we've always wanted to get some, so we want to control everything. That's the human nature. We want to control everything around us in our environment. And we just can't control the weather and it drives us nuts. So the best thing we can do is to try to forecast it better to be prepared for it. But I think it's this ancient rivalry that keeps people just fascinated by it. And they secretly love when it when something completely unexpected happens, which thankfully is rare, but it keeps us humble, I think, as a species. It certainly does. Now, you talked about growing up um, on a hobby farm, and you mentioned your dad and your siblings. Was that hobby farm around the Twin Cities? Was it – where in Minnesota was it? It was in Cottage Grove, southeastern suburb at the time. I don't know that it, it, you'd really consider it a suburb, but it certainly is now. Both my parents were from St. Paul proper, and I was there till the age of three. I'm the oldest. And then once my sister was born, my parents made this decision that they wanted their kids to grow up in the country. And at that time, 1984, that was Cottage Grove. And yeah, that's what led us out there. Who was an influence on your life early on that made you think about the world the way you do? I would have to put that on my father. People who get to know me and friends and the new friends say, you know a little bit about everything. And I'm like, I get that from my father. 
humans by nature are curious, but you need somebody to set it off. And for me, that was my dad. We grew up watching PBS all the time, every nature show, watching all the animals in places like South Africa. It was fascinating watching Nova and, and Frontline and all these documentaries. And so I think that's where it came from. And we'd go outside and he knew the name of every tree species. He knew the name of every bug and would tell, we'd see a fox and he'd tell me some facts about fox. And so he's a history teacher by education, but he knew oh. he had a natural curiosity in, in kind of everything. And, I, and that's totally where that comes from. My mother was very smart, was second in her graduating high school class, but definite geeky scientist, just want to know everything comes from my dad. Do you remember high school and the version of you that was in high school and, and the, <laughs> the, 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 the Do I remember high school? Yeah, I know you remember high school. You're not old. I don't you remember. <laughs> what do you I remember was... about high school that was influential to you to decide, yes, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to study science? Yeah, I remember just wanting to be done with high school, really. Whereas a lot of people look back at it in America, especially, we have, it's this, we go a little overboard to prom and all these things that, mm -hmm. you know, are completely separate from education. Because I knew by 12, 13 years old, this obsession with weather happened quick and I knew that's what I was going to do. I had already by 13 or 14 oh. researched, okay, what schools can I go to? And St. Cloud was the closest. So that being young, you'd think that that's the most logical choice. And it worked out. I, my sister later went to grad school in Madison, which has a great meteorology program. And I thought, wow, this would have been fun, but I wouldn't have gotten anything done because I am also easily distracted. So St. Cloud was a great place to study because <laughs> there's not much else to do. But me in high school, I was just trying to get... I wanted to get it over with. I was a nerd, but I don't think everybody viewed me that way. They just viewed me as this quiet. We don't know where to put him. Like I had friends who were in the popular group and I had friends who were in the nerdy uh, math team. And I had friends, I was, you couldn't really categorize me. I, it'd be interesting for me to actually ask the people I went to high school with how they'd categorize me. I think you'd get all sorts of different answers, but mostly I was just bored of high school. I wanted to get done with it and move on to college. The math, I was like, okay, can we move on to calculus now? And <laughs> stuff that I'm going to need to, I just, yeah, I just was impatient, basically. So you went to St. Cloud, you studied science, you studied meteorology. When did you know you wanted to be on TV? Or, or, or maybe I should rephrase it. How did you know you wanted to be on TV? Is that what you wanted to do? Or were you looking at some other avenue? How did that happen? No, I didn't actually. What people don't tend to realize is meteorology is a very broad field. Everybody thinks mm -hmm. of their TV weathercaster, but that's actually a small part of the field. And at least historically, it's gotten a little better. But historically, most of them weren't even meteorologists. Now it's maybe 50-50. It's, it's gotten much better. But yeah, so I always, I knew I was going to get a meteorology degree. That's what I was going to do. I was so excited once I was like fully immersed in my meteorology classes, even though they were very tough. My first internship by chance my sophomore year, most of the science fields, you're not going to really get into an internship until your junior or senior years, just because they want to they want you to be useful and you're not going to be useful mm -hmm. unless you've had a minimum amount of, of education under your belt in the field. But I, I got an internship working for a, a private company that does forecasting. I don't even know what they're called now. I think it's Meteorologics. It was it used to be Cavorus. They're locally based in Burnsville and they do stuff for from smaller airlines. And most large airlines have their own meteorology department like Delta and for some utility companies and just all sorts of stuff. And so I interned there and then my junior year, I applied for two internships, one at the National Weather Service, which is the part of the big federal agency that does yeah. all the official forecasting and they're very competitive and they are paid which is unheard of. Mm. There are almost no paid internships in meteorology then. And yeah, this is, so this is 2002. It paid $11 an hour. And so I applied for that. And then I applied for an internship at a local TV station in the Twin Cities, thinking if I'm lucky, I, I might get one of these. Oh, fingers crossed. So I was offered both. And I thought, oh, wow. great. How am I going to, yeah, how am I going to make this work? The weather service one was obviously a pri priority because it, a, it paid. And the whole, if anyone who's familiar with federal government work, the earlier you can get in, the better, because it's a point system mm -hmm. way of moving up into positions. And we earn points by being a paid intern. So I was able to work it out with both entities. The, you know, the TV station understood that was a big deal. And so I would go to the weather service from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. most days and then drive over to the TV station and work there for 
the, no TV station internships paid then. So it was all pretty much whatever you wanted to get out of it. So I'd spend three, four hours in the evening there, which worked out because I got to see severe weather from both sides. A lot of the severe weather in Minnesota happens in the evening hours. And I would once in a while switch shifts so that if I was missing too much severe weather on the weather service side, I wanted to be there. But it was really cool that summer, actually. I don't think, I think it's unique that I don't think most people ever even deep into their career as an adult has that experience where in the same day, you're at the place that issues the warnings for severe weather, and then at the place that has to disseminate that and broadcast that out to the public and, and dealing with producers and news directors who all want to, you know, hound you about what's going to happen, where should we send a crew, and they always, media, always, big surprise, always wants to blow everything out of proportion, mm-hmm. and so they're always wanting to do that. And so seeing all sides of it in one summer was really fascinating, but it didn't help me understand what I wanted to do. The reason I applied for the TV internship was I really wanted to try internships in as many broad areas of meteorology as I could that would help me decide. And at the end of the summer, I saw equal pros and cons of both. So I was just even more indecisive. And so the way I got into TV was, it was the first job offer I had out of college. And I said, I need to start paying back loans and we'll see where this goes. So that's how that happened. And that was not at CARE 11 where you ended up spending more than a decade. That was up in Duluth, if I'm not mistaken. So in the broadcast field, you start out in a small market because we're all pretty bad out of college. Anybody who travels around the country, turn on your local news. It's always funny if, if you're in a small market, and it's, it is pretty hilarious to see the very green talent. If you live in a large city, you, you take for granted that you have the top you know, people in your field there. So I was there for just a little over two years in Duluth. And then, yeah, I got the the job offer at CARE. At the time I was 25, which was unheard of. Large, it was the number 13 market out of 212 TV markets in the country. So a big market just did not hire 25 year olds then. You were 30 minimum. So what it was the beginning of what's become a, a trend of cheaper hires. And if you can find somebody who's talented, young and cheap, that's even better. But I was really a trailblazer in that way, which was weird. Everybody there called me a kid and I was the youngest person by far really in the building. So it was unreal. And now you look at it, you'll go in there and it's full of 20s and early 30s. The whole, just the the business model of local TV news has just completely changed in 10, 15 years. I know how you feel to some extent. I was always the youngest in the room as well in the early aughts. And I always felt like the kid and they used to laugh at the fact that I wore sneakers to work. And that, that was <laughs> somewhat humbling. Do you remember your first time broadcasting? Were you nervous? Is Was that oh, something that absolutely. you even thought about? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And after being in it for two years in Duluth, I didn't have those jitters anymore. But my first time being on in the Twin Cities was like starting it all over again. But oh boy. you were skilled enough at that point to be able to contain it. But I think most people who were watching could tell that even though that I was a little nervous, but there it was, I was in my home market. So all my family was watching and friends and people I grew up with, people I couldn't even think of that would instantly recognize me then. So that was what was most daunting actually, rather than a hundred thousand strangers will be watching you is, is what would be less nerve wracking to me because I didn't want to disappoint people who knew and loved me well, and hated me too, maybe. What do you think the biggest thing was you learned while working at Care 11? Wow, that's a good question. I've never been asked that before. Biggest thing? That's a really good question. I think the biggest thing, and it's not specific to Care 11, it's working in that field of TV news. The fascinating element of teamwork that goes into that, because you have meteorologists who are scientists, you have producers who are writers, you have people on the technical side who make the broadcast happen. There aren't many collaborations, I don't think, like that. We're people from different disciplines come together to put on a a show. And so I think what's interesting about that is everybody's learning all the time. You have to be open to constantly learning. And I know that's true in every science field, but this is more broader than just even learning science. You're constantly learning more about how to make a show, really. You're a scientist at heart, but at the same time, you're trying to deliver the science to people in a way that doesn't make them feel dumb, that gives them the right information cleanly, clearly. And you're also, you also turn into a local celebrity, a TV personality. There's all these other things that are almost polluting the science to a certain extent. 
maybe it's hard to get that science through with all these other things that you have to deal with as well. So maybe another thing you learn, you have to stay true to the science. And that's, again, where if you have that natural curiosity, that will keep it going. I, I've seen many people, some that I worked with, who were in that broadcasting field too long, where they got farther and farther away from the science and more and more into the, the sort of the entertainment broadcast side of what they were doing. A little bit of a problem once it comes to, oh, all of a sudden there's a tornado again. So you do have to, you do have to keep yourself grounded into what your original purpose for it all was. Did you have people that you mentored when you were at Care 11 who you helped with the next generation with? Oh, yeah. So I, for most of the 14 years I was there, I was in charge of our interns. So we would have interns every summer. We collaboratively as a, a team made the decision on who we would ultimately hire, but I would really organize their schedules and, and how, what we were going to teach them and who they're going to work with and that sort of thing. And I also taught at my alma mater several times. There's a broadcast meteorology course, part of the meteorology major as an elective for those who do want to go into broadcasting. And I taught that class, I think, three or four times um, from about 2008 through 2015, I think was the last time I taught it. So yeah, I did a lot with actually shaping and molding some of the, the future people in the field. It's important. I think that's such an amazing thing to be doing, to be giving back to science, to giving back to the community, to make sure that we have those young scientists and young people coming up that are able to continue the torch and bring those new ideas and new perspectives. It's, it's wonderful to see you doing that. And what I loved about it, too, is you learned along the way, too, because if you're having to explain what you're doing and how and why to somebody, you understand better why you're doing it, frankly. Wasn't it Feynman that said something like, you don't really understand something until you can explain it to someone else? Yeah, or I think I've heard like a five-year-old or something, which is if you can't simplify it to that extent, you don't truly understand it. And, that, and I, that's always really resonated with me. If, you can't, if I can't explain something in meteorology to my four-year-old nephew, for example, then I truly am not going to be able to convey that to maybe yeah. a lot of people. And what are you doing now? You're no longer at CARE. I see you online everywhere. I am more on digital platforms than ever before. I'm a meteorologist for Bring Me the News, which is a digital um, news platform. They've decided in the last couple of years to really invest in their weather and not just be a news site that just links to the weather service or something, but actually provides. Mm. And this is what I've told people as TV news is changing. That model of a meteorologist explaining the forecast to you, whatever that will look like, is never going away because a lot of people still find a lot of value in explaining the weather and the forecast. We all, I hope at least, most people have learned by now that if you just look at the app on your phone, it's garbage usually, especially when there's actual weather happening. On a day like the next several where we're sitting here and it's all sunny in 80s, yeah, okay, that's good enough. But when there's something actually happening, uh, people really value that extra information. What I've found too, which is encouraging to me, especially in this era of what seems to be an attack on science, a lot of people yeah. value learning something too. Not Don't just tell me that this storm is going through, but explain why, what are the, what are the ingredients that led to this? You hear a lot of people say, oh, it's hot and humid. Why didn't it storm today? So you explain what a cap is and, and all these other things, and they find that fascinating. And then that way, if the forecast is blown, they at least have heard some logic go into it. And they're like, it must have been because this didn't. Instead of just looking at the app and saying, there was a, a lightning bolt there, and it, there was no lightning. So what happened? You're right about the apps being trash. They're, they're all trash. But they there was one that wasn't half bad did you ever or do you know about dark sky i'm sure you do I there don't was think a I do, actually dark sky used to be this great app and apple gobbled it up and it wasn't based on the data that comes from the sensors that as i understand it are there's basically one source of data and one source of information and that's mm -hmm. the national weather service and that uses the ibm network i think somehow this app had a different network and that's why its data was apparently more accurate. Does that sound like junk to you, what I just said? 
This is all stuff I I heard and thought and and have absorbed, and I have no idea whether that was accurate. I I can't say definitively one way or the other, but what I can say in in defense of apps is part of why we have an app on our phone is to make something simple, quick, and easy. And weather just isn't always simple, quick, and easy. And it's also really hard to have a forecast for a good forecast done for every zip code in the country. So what, for example, the app on most people's iPhones comes from the Weather Channel, and it's basically an average of computer model data that's over a grid. And so it, if you're in this point on the grid, that's what you get. You just would have to have a huge number of meteorologists to actually make a good, accurate, thoughtful forecast for each spot. And so that's actually one of the things I'm working on right now. You'll see on Twitter occasionally, it's called Currently. So Eric Holthaus is a climatologist who garnered, he has over a million followers, I think, on Twitter. And he garnered a lot of attention during Hurricane Sandy a number of years ago by explaining the science of what was happening, how a hurricane could hit New York, but also putting it in a climate change context and saying this We can expect more of this more frequently in the future. And he got tons of followers during all that. So he's worked with Twitter. It says Twitter's blessing and investment to, so what we're doing is in in each so far larger market in the country, going to the, what's seen as the go-to meteorologist in that area, like the trusted source for weather and having them do a, a daily forecast discussion that's in an email form right now, but we're launching a text service where you can ask questions about the forecast and that meteorologist will answer it. And really getting back to this, instead of just broad brush, let's just take an average, which is what the app does. You're actually getting the trusted meteorologist in your market giving you information. And so he chose me in the Minneapolis St. Paul market. And then he has, there's somebody in New York, but he's also, there's some in Mumbai, India. And then in addition to that, providing context in terms of climate change and um, some social and environmental justice issues that all go out in this email. But it's really trying to get people want to have a conversation with somebody about weather. Through TV, it's yes. always been a one way. We just talk to you and there's no. And that's what's been fun about expanding and doing all my forecasts digitally is I'm much more in tune with my viewers and more feedback and it's more interactive which I find actually really rewarding for me too, because it keeps it more exciting. How do I get at that newsletter? How do I get it? That's a good question. I think if you go to current, let's see, if you go to Twitter and at currently, you can click on, they have the link, it's currentlyhq.com and you can sign up for the newsletter in your area. And yeah, so like today I, I didn't talk about the boring forecast ahead. I can say that in one sentence, hey, it's going to be sunny, Average temperatures, low humidity, enjoy it. It won't last for long until next week. But hey, let's dive into one more measurement of how hot this summer's been. It's one thing to look at average temperature and how many 90s we've had. But what's also remarkable about this summer, just another way to measure how hot it's been, is how little we've had in the way of cool nights, which is what makes Minnesota usually so much more comfortable of a climate in the summer than areas to the south as it does cool off at night usually. And so I dove into the stats that to date, Meteorological summer, June 1st to August 12th, we should have 23 nights that are below 60 degrees, even in Minneapolis, where we have an urban heat island, but we've only had seven. So it's another measurement of we just haven't been cooling off at night this summer. So that's one of many reasons why your AC has been running more. I was going to ask you what the most important thing we're not doing as a species. What is the most important thing we're not doing? And mostly the follow-up question is, How can we change that? That's the trillion dollar question, isn't it, really? I think climate change is huge, but I think it's this broader issue. And I would put climate change under the umbrella, actually, which many may may not, of broader conservation. So it's how we view the planet we're on. Is it here for us to use or are we a part of it? And we can't live without Earth, but Earth can certainly go on without us. Even if we trash it, it will still be a rock that's in sort of the Goldilocks zone of climate for planets. And nature in some form will come back. It doesn't need us, but we do need it. We have, as advanced as we are, we have not found a way to live without 
the resources of planet Earth. But you'll hear the climate deniers say, oh, you can be on Mars. I'm like, mm, yeah, we're a little ways off from colonizing Mars. And I don't want to live on Mars. I don't know about the rest of no. you, but if you've ever been in a wild place, whether it's South Africa or woods in northern Minnesota or deep in the Arctic, as I've been at several times, those places are so incredibly cool to be in and they're changing so fast. We live in such a fast pace that I think a lot of people just don't have time to sit and think about it. Or when they do, they just see like a gloom and doom story on the news and think, well, ah, okay, that was, what can I do? And so I think that we, we got to take the hopelessness out of the problem, first of all, because a lot of people feel hopeless about it. But we do have to really, we as a species, think about can we live differently so that we living sustainable sustainability gets used a lot, but in terms of conservation and climate change, it means living in a way where we're in harmony with the planet rather than destroying it. And it has to do, a lot of people have heard this, it has to do with choices and what we eat. You can't have a cheeseburger and steak every day. I love it too, but make it a special meal. It's just the way we use land has to change and, and where we live has to change. One of the worst inventions ever that was made in the United States is suburbia. It's mm -hmm. just such a, it's such a destruction of land. There's a lot of different avenues there. I had the pleasure of meeting and interviewing Dr. Jane Goodall a couple years ago. And mm. what really even changed my mindset is here at the time she was, I think, 86 or 87. She was traveling the world still most days of the year, 200 something days a year. She's traveling to raise awareness, money for her foundation, uh, the Jane Goodall Institute, which one of the big things it does to combat climate change and conservation is going into poor, less developed parts of the world and investing in those communities. Because she always said, you, you can put up as many national parks and fences as you want, but if the local people are struggling to survive, it doesn't matter. Poaching happens because somebody is you know, trying to survive. At the top of the chain, we can blame Chinese mafia or Vietnamese demand for traditional medicine, but they wouldn't have the in South Africa or Namibia or Kenya or wherever it would Botswana. be, that local person, mm -hmm. yeah, to do the poaching if there wasn't somebody who had to feed their family. So invest in, in the places that you don't expect to invest so that you can just make life better for everyone, honestly. Yeah, and you teach them appreciation. I know I've done a lot of stuff with Save the Rhino Trust in Namibia, and one of the things they do there locally is teach the kids pride. Hey, these are your rhinos. This is this. These are your rhinos. This is your country. Be proud of that. And also transforming the tourism industry in Namibia so that it's the people who are benefiting from it are the locals. And so that rhino is gold to your community and much more so alive than dead. Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, you've been down to Southern Africa, haven't you? Yes. How do you like it down there? I I always tell people who say, oh, I'd really love to do that trip that you did. When I come back from, I've been to Botswana, South Africa, um, Namibia a few times, Zimbabwe. And I tell people, I said, just be prepared. Once you go to Africa, you will fall in love and mm -hmm. you're going to have to go back. It's not a place that you can go to once. First of all, there's too much to see. <laughs> you can't do Africa yeah, right. one trip. I think it's in the soul of every human. We all originated there as a species, but it's, and I think just from a, the conservation standpoint, I call Africa the last of the megafauna. The planet used to be inhabited by lots of big animals. And really that's the one continent left that has really numerous megafauna, big animals. We wiped out the bison in North America. It's now understood that woolly mammoths and a lot of the big ice age creatures died as a it's the first case of humans and a changing climate destroying biodiversity. Now then, the climate was changing because we're coming out of the Ice Age. That was a stressor. But then you had this new species that was smart and really good at hunting on the landscape. And that was the tipping point. And so when I teach climate to middle schoolers, for example, I always start with the Ice Age and talk about this is that first case of humans on the scene and a changing climate. I try to teach them that this is not the first time this has happened. And this time we've both altered the climate and we are species that are putting that extra stress on other species. And that's the tipping point. Cause people always say the climate's always changed. A polar bear can handle it. I'm like, yeah. And they're very well adaptable, but this is different and it's happening too fast and we're responsible and you can make the argument we're a, sp we're a species on the planet. So whatever we do is also a natural part of what happens on the planet. But I don't want to be 
personally responsible for this mass extinction crisis that we're in. And I think most people think the same. I agree with you. We're at a point now where we just, it seems to get, be getting dire, more dire by the day. And I, I still believe that there is something we can do. The latest report that came out seems to indicate that's, that it's still not too late, but we do have to change our behavior and do so quickly. And as individuals, we can do what we can, but it's really sweeping policy changes and sweeping changes by governments across the planet that, that are really going to fuel this kind of change that will get us to the other side in a more positive and happy way, I suppose. Yeah, and that's the yeah. sad thing. I think our children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, whatever, are going to look back shamefully with the, the, the last few decades. And we wasted so much time that so we are in this situation where we have to do big, drastic things quickly, where we could have started tackling this when the scientists said we needed to. And I hope that's a lesson, whether it's for COVID or it's for climate change. Mm -hmm. I hope we learn. Humans, we do get better. Even when we're in a slump, you look at humanity through time, it like temperatures on a graph, the ups and downs, but the trend is upward. We always get better. There's less slavery now than there was a thousand years ago, luckily. We have more compassion, I think, as much as there's killing in the world. Fewer people die in wars now than historically. Yes, that, that's a very important thing to do. And I think that's probably something we can end on. It's getting better is what you're saying. Yes, and we, but we got But it requires work. We can't be lazy. No, we can't be lazy. Sven, I've enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, your history, your story with us. It's been lovely to get to know you a little bit more and to learn that your father was in the seventy six Olympics. What a wonderful thing to to hear as well. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool for a nineteen year old, huh? Yeah, very cool, very cool. Thank you very much for spending your time with me today. You're very welcome. I hope you'll join us in the next episode of One of Eight Billion, when we hear from content strategy expert and self-described nerdy tech guy, Jeff Eaton. Two to three years ago, I was diagnosed with adult ADHD, and I was very set in the traditional assumption that ADHD looks like a hyperactive kid running around in circles when he should be studying for class. I start realizing like, oh, no, actually, that's, that's a neurological thing. There's this thing called executive function that is literally your brain taking an idea like, oh, man, I should really do my taxes and turning it into you standing up and going over and getting papers and a pencil and starting work on that. The executive function is what actually does the work of making those tasks happen in your brain. And ADHD is a disorder that basically means you don't have a working executive function. If you meet anybody who's survived to adulthood without their life falling apart and has ADHD, you've met someone who's figured out how to weaponize anxiety as a substitute for executive function. This has been One of Eight Billion, a podcast about all of us, online at oneof8b.com. Join us again next time as we listen to one of 8 billion other stories. One of 8 billion is supported by 107, a technology studio whose mission is to make things that matter. Find out more at 107.com. I'm Ivan Stegich. Thank you for listening. You